You know what? I've been around for a while. I've traveled the world, met some interesting people, done some crazy things. So you might just think there's not much that could take me by surprise. You'd be wrong. The world is full of stories and science and things that amaze and confound me every single day. Incredible mysteries that keep me awake at night. Some I can answer. Others just defy logic. Like the man who falls 47 stories from a New York skyscraper to the street below and lives. Or what about the mysterious and deadly ice chunks the size of basketballs falling from the sky and smashing into people's homes? And then there's the bizarre story of the seven dismembered feet that washed up on the beaches of Vancouver wearing sneakers. Yep. It's a weird world. And I love it. December 7th, 2007. New Yorkers witnessed one of the strangest events in the city's history. I can remember myself and the other guys looking up and saying, it can't be. It's something that I cannot explain. A dramatic accident with an outcome that justifies reason. Listen to this. Our modern way of life runs on rules. Laws that need to be obeyed, telling us what we can or cannot do. But really, most of these rules can't stop you from doing anything. If you choose to, you can break laws. But science is quite different. Take physics, for example. Here, there are indisputable laws that physically cannot be challenged. Certain facts that are absolute. I mean, the laws of gravity are not exactly open to interpretation, right? It's nearly Christmas in New York. An exciting time for everyone in the city, including brothers Alcides and Edgar Moreno. A working team. December 7th is another regular day on the job. But the Moreno job is far from regular. High above the streets of the Big Apple, Alcides and Edgar do what would certainly give me the heebie-jeebies. They're high-rise window washers. The window washers that I speak to seem to enjoy their work. They can enjoy the sunrise in the morning. Uh, and this is their chosen field, and they like it. Today, the brothers will be cleaning the solo residences at East 66th Street, in over 400 feet of glass. On the roof, the men prepare to launch a platform like this one. It's designed to suspend them on the side of the building as they work. Unknown to them, there is a serious malfunction, and the Moreno brothers are just moments from a terrifying and spectacular accident. The uh, two window washers were uh, preparing to launch the rig that morning. So they got their equipment ready on the roof of the building. So they had a bucket of hot water, they had squeegees, and they had this rig attached to a carriage and had electric motors that would elevate them and uh, hold them in place. Photos from that day show the brothers put down their lunches before positioning the platform. It's approximately 22 feet in length by two and a half foot wide, and it's designed to carry two workers. Then they swung the rig over the edge of the building and got on the rig. When the men stepped on the platform, the platform immediately gave way. I saw the commotion. There were a lot of people standing in the street around the building screaming and pointing. New York State Safety Inspector Kevin Dillon arrives on the scene and is witness to the carnage. There was debris all over the place, scattered all over the place. There was blood. Tragically, 30-year-old Edgar Moreno was killed instantly. But among the wreckage, Paramedic Gary Smiley makes an amazing discovery. 
We entered the debris field because they had said there was a guy in there. And uh, we started to move a lot of the metal and the debris. When I first saw him, he was in a sitting position. Um, his hands were up around his chest. I went to touch him and he gasped. And that took us aback because then we realized that this gentleman is actually still alive. I can remember myself and the other guys looking up and just saying to ourselves, it can't be, it's just impossible. With no time wasted, Alcides is rushed to the hospital. The fall has left him with broken ribs and legs and severe spinal injuries. But just two weeks later, on Christmas Day... I don't know what adjective you'd care to use. Unprecedented, extraordinary. If you are a believer in miracles, this would be one. Alcides gives his wife, Rosario, the best present she could ever wish for. He speaks for the first time since the accident. He will make an incredible recovery. I don't know what to tell you. I'm still at all. I'm still in shock. I've worked as a paramedic in New York City for approximately 25 years, and I've never seen anyone fall from that height before and survive. It's truly amazing. And I think Alcides has a guardian angel. To fall in excess of over 400 feet, it's just truly amazing. It would be millions and millions and millions to one of the odds of, of surviving a fall like that. I, I just can't explain how, how he could do that. Okay, even for New York City, this story is weird. Let's think about this. My single story house must be what? 15 feet high? Even though I fell off my roof, it could be fatal. So imagine if my house was over 400 feet high. How can someone fall? 47 stories and survive. The whole descent would have been over in, in less than five seconds. But during that time, something extraordinary must have happened. But what? So let's try and unravel this seemingly impossible mystery by starting at the top. It's up here that investigators have discovered that the cause of the accident might be the key to understanding how Alcides Moreno survived. According to evidence recovered from the accident scene, the fall was set in motion by two simple but deadly events. The first concerned the Moreno brothers themselves. If the workers had followed all the safety rules and regulations, they would have been attached to their safety ropes and would have been left dangling on the side of the building. So why weren't the Moreno brothers saved by theirs? Simple. They weren't wearing them. The second crucial event concerned the way the scaffold had been set up. Now, the window washing platform was supported by cables connected to two arms overhead. These loops of cables fastened by crimps were the only things securing the rig to the building. And while analyzing photos of the wreckage, U.S. Labor Department official Richard Mendelson discovered just how that rig failed. Here we see a, a shot of one of the crimps. So this is a crimp we recovered from the scene. And the crimps are the attachment devices that were supposed to hold that wire rope together. Amazingly, these two tiny crimps are capable of supporting the full 1,700-pound weight of a window washing platform and its crew if properly fitted. And what caused the platform ultimately to collapse was the fact that the crimps had not been pushed in enough. Since it wasn't crimped enough, the added weight of those, the two brothers, the two workers, as soon as they stepped on the platform was enough to cause it to uh, fall. But, and this is crucial, it's believed both crimps failed nearly simultaneously. That means the platform was more or less horizontal when it fell and the two men stayed on board as it plummeted to the street below. This is where hard science takes over. Physicist Professor Brian Schwartz has investigated every inch of this fall, and he believes the platform may have contributed to Alcides' survival by slowing the rate of his descent. It's, it's a very improbable event. If it were to happen again, the likelihood of survival is very, very small. The platform had a total area of 55 square feet, so that presented a fairly wide area, and as a result, the drag force was quite large. That cuts the velocity by about 50 miles an hour. Okay, let's think about this some more. When objects fall, air resistance pushes up to oppose the force of gravity pulling down. 
If the men hadn't been on the platform, they would have hit the ground at around 110 miles per hour. But because the force of drag was pushing up against the bottom of the platform they were standing on, they were slowed to around 60 miles per hour. Does that help? It's better than 110, but uh, 60 miles an hour is still fast enough to really result in, uh, in usually death. So the fact that Alcides was still on the platform wasn't enough to save his life during the fall. But what about the landing? In some final split-second twist of fate, could something have broken Alcides' fall enough to save his life? Could the platform have helped him here? It's weird but true. High-rise window washer Alcides Moreno survived the seemingly impossible a 47-story fall from a New York skyscraper. But how? As investigators poured over the evidence, they discovered something even weirder. An incredible series of events in the final split seconds that may have combined to break our city's fall. What we can see here is we can see scrape marks and some damage to a parapet on one of the windows and then a scrape going down the face of the building. And this is where we believe that the, uh, the side of the scaffold platform impacted the short building next to it. No one knows for sure if this impact was the moment that caused Edgar Moreno to be thrown from the platform and killed. One thing though is certain, Alcides remained on the platform with the rate of his descent reduced as he entered the final phase of the accident. The fall occurred in a certain way in which the sides of the scaffolding hit the buildings there in the alleyway, and as a result, the landing was a lot longer and a lot softer than it would have been had he just hit the ground flat. After hitting a ledge, the platform struck a low wall opposite, breaking his fall further and causing the platform to react in a crucial way that saves Alcides' life. When the the platform impacted the adjacent building in that short wall, it collapsed into a V. And my understanding is that Alcides was located in that V when the platform collapsed onto itself. But how would that have saved his life? Being a big fan of NASCAR and growing up with the family, we've always watched these horrific crashes where the car rolls and burns and all of a sudden you see a hand go in and releases a seat belt and a guy walks away from a crash and you scratch your head and you say well how the how did he survive that you know and this in my opinion is exactly how he survived i believe that the platform created a roll cage uh, and protected his body the platform acted like a spring in some sense that it it broke his fall well what an irony the very platform that caused this terrible accident helped protect Alcides. But that's not all. You see, Alcides' posture may also have helped save him too. The force of stopping got distributed over his whole body, so the force on any one part of his body was a lot smaller than it would have been had he hit, let's say, with his head first or feet first. You had 47 floors worth of cable and rope that was down in the backyard. It was a, a pretty immense rubble field that he was just, you know, is as if somebody just placed him in the middle of it and, the, and probably the only, you know, survival position you could have found him in. It's the last piece to this incredible puzzle. Against odds of millions to one, a bizarre series of events combined to save this window washer's life. Many people believe Alcides' survival was a miracle. Well, if you think a miracle can be defined as incredibly good luck, they may be right. But it was also combined with the mind-boggling dynamics of simple physics. I like physics. You don't need me to tell you that the modern world can be a pretty dangerous place. Every day you go out the door, there's literally a million and one ways you can meet a terrible end. But, you know, man's home is his castle. There's no safer place to be, right? 
At least that's what I used to think, but guess what? Times are changing. Now me, you, everyone we know is in mortal danger at all times from a mystery assailant who can strike at our homes at any time. You see, all over the world, unidentified objects have begun falling from clear blue skies with destructive and potentially fatal and very scary consequences. Come with me to the sleepy rural town of Brush, Colorado. Danelle Hagen was in the comfort of her own home when she was attacked. This is my home behind me. Mm -hmm. Saturday morning, my daughter and I got up and were just doing normal Saturday morning relaxing kind of things. And I had gone to sit at the computer, which is just right outside the kitchen area. Kind of quiet, having the coffee, trying to wake up. Relaxing at home, Danelle has no idea her Saturday morning calm is about to be shattered in the most terrifying and weird way. So I was sitting about three feet outside the kitchen door when I heard a huge, what sounded like an explosion. And I got up, thought I was going to get up and look outside and see some horrific thing outside. I kind of turned to my left, which would have been towards the kitchen. And in that instant, the kitchen had been destroyed. I had beams hanging, ceiling had crashed in. Just unbelievable. And I was in shock, just speechless. I was too dumbfounded to be scared at that point. Immediately after the explosion, I think I was in too much shock to be scared. My daughter was hysterical. She came running out, screaming, crying. She couldn't get out of the house fast enough. And at that point, I was trying to decide if it was safer for us to be there. I didn't know if a gas line, something had happened, and if something else would explode. And I was basically in shock. I really didn't know what to do at that point. Initially, Danelle thinks it was caused by an exploded gas line. But when an inspector surveys the damage, its extraordinary origins are revealed. The guy said, you know, you didn't have an explosion out. You had something crash through. As we started looking around the kitchen is when we first saw this huge chunk of ice, about the size of a bowling ball. A huge ball of ice weighing about 20 pounds had crashed into Danelle's home. When I saw the large chunk of ice, I didn't immediately connect it with anything having crashed through. It was just, oh, how odd. You know, why would there be ice in the middle of all this rubble in the kitchen? So I didn't immediately put it together. It was after the fire department came and the gentleman from the gas company that we all started piecing things together. Ice? But ice is our friend. We skate on it. We put it in our drinks. We use it to help relieve injured muscles. Oh, no. This ice was not nice. It was huge. Just like this one. Weighing about 20 pounds. Imagine this crashing through your ceiling. So where in heaven's name did a piece of ice this size come from? Basketball-sized piece of ice. Maybe Shaq O'Neal finally made a free throw. To answer that question, I'm going to need some help. Some friends of mine, researchers at the Texas Tech, are going to see what kind of damage ice can do. How are they going to do this? With a huge cannon, of course. Today we're going to shoot some ice. Sounds like fun. Let's get on with it. In their first test, they're going to shoot a five-pound ice chunk at its terminal velocity. That's the fastest speed that an object can fall through the air. For a five-pound chunk, the terminal velocity is about 110 miles per hour. This is going to simulate the speed of a ball of ice the size of a melon falling from at least 2,000 feet. Clear. Three. Two, one. Well, look at that. It went right through like a bullet. Let's see that again in slow motion. I've always wanted to say that.
So we've confirmed that a falling chunk of ice can rip through the roof of a house, but this is nowhere near the destruction scene in Donnell's roof. It is estimated that a ball of ice the size of a basketball, like the one that hit Donnell's house, would have likely been traveling at a terminal velocity of approximately 150 miles per hour. But the test is only a partial success because we're not able to calculate from what height the ball of ice actually fell. To determine this, we'll need more clues. The most likely suspect, you might think, is this stuff, hail. Frozen water droplets that form in thunderstorm clouds up to 70,000 feet high and have been known to do some serious damage. Like here in Edmonton, Canada, where in 2007, hail the size of baseballs smashed down from dark, heavy clouds onto residential areas. But 700 miles away in Vancouver, a sky filled with thunderstorm clouds isn't exactly what Chris Drab remembers when a huge ice bomb crunched into his neighborhood in 2009. This was undoubtedly the strangest and most fascinating thing I've ever seen in my life. It was a um, very hot, sunny, bright Friday afternoon and I was mowing my lawn and uh, I hear what was uh, a loud noise like an artillery shell or something thundering. And I look up in the sky and I see something falling at in incredible velocity. I could see coming down this direction here uh, what looked like a large chunk of rock or a large chunk of something, you know, trailing a, a plume of white debris or smoke after it. I didn't know what to think of it. It, it, it didn't compute because the, the sky was sunny, it was hot, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. Just like the case of Donnell Hagen, Drab's ice bombs came from seemingly nowhere on a perfectly calm and sunny afternoon, meaning it can't be hail. Weirder and weirder. Okay, where else could it be coming from? Here's a clue. Danelle's house happens to also be in the approaching flight path of a major airport. Coincidence? Could the world of aviation be responsible for these mysterious ice bombs? As commercial pilot Stuart McCaskill knows, the aviation industry has problems of its own with ice. There's been a lot of accidents because of icing on airplanes. So now icing and flying and icing is of, of a huge importance and a number one item in all of aviation. Right, so ice builds up on the aircraft in two ways, on the ground or in flight. Flight icing occurs when a plane flies through a cloud filled with tiny droplets of supercooled water that freezes upon impact. For ice to form on a wing, you need supercooled water droplets. As ice builds up, it doesn't conform to the wing, it's all over the place, and you can get varying degrees of, of aerodynamic instability. So it's a weight thing, so you're destroying the lift. Yeah. There is no doubt ice can be a major problem. That's why the aviation industry has developed sophisticated anti-icing equipment. So we've looked at the wheel well, we've looked at the wing. Yeah, a shiny nose, I'm sorry. But is there any place left on the plane we still haven't looked? Could the urban legend of airplanes letting go of their frozen toilet waste in midair <laughs> actually be true? <laughs> Is it possible that the 20-pound ice chunk that fell from the sky and destroyed Danelle Haken's kitchen originated in the lavatory of a passing commercial airliner? An aircraft uh, system is just the same as an RV system in that it is self-contained. This is the access panel for the lab service, and uh, it's serviced on the ground, in flight, not accessible, and any seepage from this area in flight would be minuscule and certainly would not build, lead to any ice buildup that would uh, fall from the airplane. I can't imagine where this sort of ice formation would take place or anything of this size 
on an airplane and then jettison itself and fall to the earth. I, I really can't imagine how that might happen. Okay, this is getting spooky. If it's not hail, and it's not from an aircraft, maybe we need to go higher still to find the source of these killer ice bombs. Could the culprit be from outer space? Take comets. Comets are made of rock, dust, frozen gases, and, you guessed it, ice. Ice that vaporizes to resemble a tail as they approach the sun. The scary part? Sometimes they smash into planets, like in 1994 when a fragment from Comet B. Shoemaker, Levy 9, collided with Jupiter, releasing a frightening energy equivalent to six million megatons of TNT. But, as astronomer Robert Stencil knows, the Earth has a natural defense system to help protect us from similar disasters. What we anticipate happens when comets encounter the Earth's atmosphere is that they heat up in a hurry and 99.999% of that would vaporize before they reach the ground. So could the ball of ice that destroyed Danelle Hagen's kitchen have been the surviving remnant of a comet? For something to survive to the ground and still be the size of a, a basketball, it would probably have to be of order a million times larger. And that's the problem. In a world that constantly watches the skies, would a comet 160 miles across plummeting through space towards us go unnoticed? I hope not. So, we checked out Hale, we checked out the plane, we checked out the bathroom, and we checked up in space. Where else is there left to look? Meet meteorologist David Jones. He has a theory that we are dealing with a whole new kind of weather phenomena that puts us all in potential danger. They're not cosmic, they're not from space. The theory is that these great chunks of ice form very high in the upper atmosphere, above the level where most of normal day-to-day -day weather occurs. Okay, this is where we need a good old-fashioned sixth grade science lesson right here in the boundary region between the moist upper troposphere and the cold lower stratosphere where Jones believes the process of ice crystal formation starts. Wind shear caused by the mixing of warm and cold air creates powerful turbulence that is strong enough to keep ice bombs aloft as they grow. And the growth of those ice crystals is supported by the turbulence. And the turbulence in this very moist air allows the crystals to grow, somewhat like hailstones do, until they're so heavy that the strong winds can't support them and they fall to the ground. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What are these mutant ice monsters called? I'll tell you. Mega cr cre cremata? Jeez, I'm sorry, guys. I'll get it right next time when there's no airplane. There's nothing wet, I promise you. So what are these mutant ice monsters called? I'll tell you. Mega... Uh, yeah. Mega cryometeor. Mega, meaning large, cryo, meaning ice, and meteor, meaning of atmospheric origin. Frighteningly, Reports of these mega cryometeors seem to be on the increase. In 2007, for example, a resident of Tampa, Florida, was working on his red-hot Ford Mustang when suddenly it got iced by a chunk the size of a basketball. Yikes! It struck with so much force, the roof was completely flattened, and the heavy sports car bounced four feet off the ground. Since about 1950, there have been about 100 verifiable reports of these ice chunks falling from clear blue sky. Since about 2001, there's been well over 50 of these events reported. And that, according to many scientists, is because mega cryometeors might be yet another consequence of global warming, increasing the levels of warm air that reach the stratosphere. There's no way to say whether we're going to see more of these weird events in the future. So whether the mega cryometeor theory is true or not, one thing is for sure. It's time to watch the skies. Because you might be next. Or even worse, 
me. Some people just love hanging out at the beach, not me. I'm a pool kind of guy. I don't like skimming it, but I like swimming in it. I mean, just think about all the dangerous and slimy creatures that are in the ocean, and then there's all the junk we put in there. Pollution, trash, sewage. Did you know it's been estimated that for every square mile of ocean, there's around 45,000 pieces of floating plastic in it? Whew. This next tale is about the most sinister, mysterious, and downright, I'm sorry, weird collection of seaborne debris ever to wash up on the shores of North America. Vancouver, British Columbia, a lovely place, famous throughout the world for staging the 2010 Winter Olympics, but infamous for a series of grisly and downright weird discoveries. August 20th, 2007, Jedediah Island near Vancouver, a young girl taking a walk on the beach makes a disgusting discovery. November 12th, 2008, a couple walking their dogs just a few miles away in Richmond, British Columbia, discover something equally as horrific. I saw a running shoe thrown up on a rock. I felt a strange sensation. It compelled me to do something about it. Not visual, it's just a sense that I had. Curiosity soon turned to fear when they looked inside. Then I could see there's something in it, so I wanted to figure out what it was. The shoe was in uh, pretty good condition. As I turned it over, uh, it looked like a athletic sock that had been well-aged with uh, what I would call a large ham knuckle bone in there. Now this is where it gets really scary because what lay in the shoe wasn't animal flesh. It was a human foot. So what do we have? Two Vancouver beaches, two unrelated feet. It was a shocking find, but amazingly, according to police, not actually that odd. There's a number of waterways that uh, surround Mitchell, Vancouver area, so it's not that unusual to have a variety of body parts wash up, and it's not usually newsworthy. These two feet were just the beginning, and as more sneakers wash up, news of this macabre mystery quickly spreads fear throughout the region. The left foot was spotted Monday morning floating in the waters off Westham Island. The kind of case you could see in a crime show on television, but it's happening right now in the Gulf Islands. After the fifth, sixth, seventh foot, it does appear pretty odd, pretty unusual. And, and of course, a number of theories have been put forward to us by the public through our website, etc. And uh, there's certainly a curiosity uh, as to what's happening. In a little over a year, a total of seven feet wash up on beaches in close proximity to Vancouver. Five right feet and two left, all wearing sneakers. The media call it the case of the missing feet. Meanwhile, the police and criminologist Dr. Gail Anderson struggled to identify who the decomposing body parts belonged to. We have DNA uh, on all of the, the um, feet that have been found. The problem is we don't have anything to match it to. Your DNA alone isn't going to tell you anything. It's just a barcode. And you see, that's the problem. Without bodies, identifying the victims is nearly impossible. But at least analyzing the DNA does provide some data. Our investigation determined that the third foot and the fifth foot were a match, and the fourth foot and sixth foot were also a match. However, we still don't know who those feet belong to. The case of the missing feet. A shudder at the thought. Where did these seven sneakers come from? And to whom did the feet inside belong? All over the world, journalists, scientists, bloggers, and amateur sleuths 
weighed in with their theories. We're funeral home workers dumping bodies in the ocean. We're medical students carrying out a sick prank. Or was this the work of another Vancouver serial killer? Yes. I said another one. A number of people have uh, brought up the theory of it's probably and the other serial killer. In 2007, Robert Picton was convicted of the murder of six Vancouver women and charged in the deaths of 20 more. Could he have been responsible for the feet too? But if the feet had been cut off by a serial killer, the telltale signs of the act would be visible to forensic experts like coroner Jeff Dolan. With respect to separation, whether it's a natural or mechanical separation from the body, experts who conduct tool mark analysis would examine the, the bones to see what type of mechanism had actually separated that bone from the rest of the body. But the team came up with a surprising answer. There is no evidence that there was any kind of mechanical separation of these bones. They've come apart um, at their natural point of separation. So if the feet had not been intentionally severed, what happened? Dr. Anderson believes she has the answer based on her research into what happens to submerged flesh as it decomposes. This is Venus. This is the Victoria Experimental Network under the sea to look at decomposition underwater so that I could see how a body decomposes, what animals feed on it. When you bring the body ashore, you, want, you see marks on the body. Well, well, what's that? Is that suspicious? Is that foul play? Or is that just something naturally caused by animals in that area? Instead of putting more human cadavers at the bottom of the ocean, Anderson has another option, a pig. Pig carcass is very similar to human, so they do decompose in a very similar manner to the way a human body decomposes. And they're fed on, certainly terrestrially, by insects on land uh, in a very similar manner to that of uh, um, a pig carcass, to a human body. So uh, we use these in a lot of our experiments. So we hope that these would be very, very similar to what would happen in a human case. According to Dr. Anderson, the sea is a very inhospitable place for bodies. So in these cases with Venus, we've been able to see it actually performed by these animals, by the, the crabs in particular, the, the large Dungeness crabs and also the smaller squat lobsters. Once the flesh is gone, it doesn't take long for the body to come apart, a nasty process known as disarticulation. Wrists and ankles have got lots of tiny little bones in them, so it's, it's very easy to, to disarticulate those by natural activity. Okay, so the process of decomposition underwater will lead parts of the body to come loose to disarticulate. So why was it that only feet were washing up on the beaches of British Columbia? Why not hands or, or even heads? Perhaps the answer lies in the footwear itself. The feet that have been washed ashore were in running shoes. Now if you think about a running shoe, throw one in a swimming pool, it floats. So it's a flotation device, and I think that's probably why you're specifically finding feet and not finding the rest of the body. Okay, so we know that feet can naturally come free as a body decomposes. We figured out why they floated ashore. But the real mystery remains. Where did the seven feet come from? In a little over a year, seven dismembered feet washed up on beaches in and around Vancouver. Police now know that the feet weren't sawn off, thankfully, and that it was the sneakers that floated them to shore. But the origins of these feet remain a mystery. Many believe that the feet were a grim souvenir of the massive Asian tsunami of 2004, a theory supported by the fact that one of the shoes found was only sold in India in 2003. We were getting phone calls, emails, letters from around the world, people who had missing uh, family members from a tsunami. Seems plausible, but according to oceanographer Eddie Carmack, the tsunami theory holds no water. One thing to understand about the oceans is that they are a, a, a system highways that, that we call gyres. Water goes around and around in these gyral orbits. And particles following these orbits can come from great distances at sea. I would think it very unlikely that the feet would have come from the Indian Ocean. Uh, the ocean currents don't link up that well. It's not a very direct path. And if something did drift from there, it would take uh, well over a decade to reach these shores. 
Given that feet started appearing just three years after the tsunami, investigators are forced to start looking for another explanation and turn to the recent crash of a small plane off the coast of British Columbia. At that stage of the investigation, only one individual had been recovered. The rest were unaccounted for. When the feet began to appear, we expected to have a hit in that cluster. But these hopes were soon dashed. The DNA from the feet doesn't match with any of the crash's victims. A global search for clues has turned up nothing. The feet can't be coming from tsunami victims. They didn't float thousands of miles across the sea. So maybe they came from closer to home. Facing a dwindling list of possible explanations, Carmack has a theory that the shoe's origin is a lot closer to home, and he has a novel way to prove it. Well, what I'm holding in my hand is a, an old recycled running shoe. Uh, it's been inserted with a satellite track GPS system, and it has been ballasted so when this is thrown in the water, it's about as close to replicating uh, the pattern that a drifting shoe would follow. By dropping these shoes from various points around Vancouver and tracking their every motion via GPS, Carmack believes he knows which currents carried the missing feet to shore. Behind me is the Alex Fraser Bridge. Fraser River is flowing uh, from my left to my right to the sea. Uh, three of the shoes were found uh, on the mouth of the river, on the islands downstream. So the direction of travel is certainly consistent with the pathway of the river. So it appears that the river, not the ocean, is the likely source of the shoes. But investigators still have no names, and they're growing desperate. So we have gone public with the photos of the footwear in the hopes that somebody would recognize it as belonging to that of their loved one. This ID tactic seems like a long shot, but apparently it's right on target. The first foot, uh, which was located on Jenadaya Island on August 20th, 2007, was later uh, identified to that of a missing uh, person, missing male from the Lower Mainland here. Uh, he was last found to be in some type of emotional distress. Suddenly, in a sea of red herrings, one theory stands out. A surprising appearance of naturally disarticulated body parts with no visible sign of homicide, all found in water systems near bridges. They could be suicide victims. They could have been people that jumped off the bridge. So we have a number of, of people that are presumed dead in, uh, in the database uh, where only their vehicle was found parked on a bridge. And while the suicide theory seems likely, it remains just that, a theory. They all remain active investigations. And there's no such thing as a cold case. We never thought that we would end up at seven feet. Only time will tell whether or not there will be an eight. In the end, there are no hard answers, just more questions. And after three years, seven feet, and endless questions, the case of the missing feet remains open and unsolved. So there we have it. Three strange and mysterious stories, but each with many plausible theories to explain them. Did Alcides Moreno survive his 47-story fall because of a freak series of events conspired to break his fall? It seems so. And the lone ice bombs falling from clear blue skies all over the world. A new quirk of global warming? Maybe. And will we ever find a conclusive answer to finally close the case of Vancouver's seven washed-up feet? Who knows? Join me next time for three new stories that will be undoubtedly weird or what? <laughs>